I suspect most of you all are somewhat like me. And when I think of Peter, Simon Peter, I don't think of a man who is a writer. I think of Peter as a large man, an orator of the first order, one that can stomp and spew and make a lot of racket. And yet, in the book of 1 Peter, we find out Peter can be very, very persuasive and very good at writing quietly, but making his point extremely well. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 21, Peter is writing to a group of new Christians, and those new Christians are having a tough time because they're suffering for their new faith. Hear how Peter speaks to them some 2,000 years ago. Hear how Peter speaks to me and to you today. He says, this is what Christ did definitively. He suffered because of other sins. The righteous one for the unrighteous ones. He went through it all was put to death and then made alive to bring us to God. He went and proclaimed God's salvation to earlier generations who ended up in the prison of judgment because they wouldn't listen. You know, even though God waited patiently all the days that Noah built his ship, only a few were saved then, eight to be exact, saved from the water by the water. The waters of baptism do that for you, not by washing away dirt from your skin, but by presenting you through Jesus' resurrection before God with a clear conscience. Jesus, Jesus has the last word on everything and everyone, from angels to armies. He's standing right alongside God. And because I too am reading from the message like George does, the last words of this passage are this in our vernacular. And what he says goes. This is the word of God and the word of the people. Thanks be to God. George, you have done me the biggest favor ever there. We don't see cowboy and Indian shows much anymore on television, and I really think that's a shame. I tried talking with my grandchildren about Tonto and the Lone Ranger, about Roy Rogers, about Pat, about Nellie Bell, the Jeep. They don't know squat about what I'm talking about. But Indians, Native Americans folks, have a great place in the history of our country. And the Comanche people many years ago moaned to the great spirit in the sky. And here's what they said, Oh great spirit, our land is dying. And we too are dying. Tell us what we've done wrong to make you so angry. End this terrible drought and save your people before we perish altogether. Tell us what we must do so that once more you will send rain and restore our land to life. And for three days, the people prayed and danced and prayed and danced. No rain, not a drop of rain came. So when the rain didn't come, the elders of the tribe went up into the hills to listen to the wind that carried the voice of the Great Spirit. And after a couple of days, they returned, and the people all gathered to hear their message. And the elder, elders solemnly said this, The Great Spirit says that the people have become selfish. For years they have taken from the earth, but given nothing back. So the Great Spirit says that we must sacrifice by taking the burnt offering of our most valued possession and scattering its ashes on the winds to the four corners of the earth. 
And when this sacrifice is completed, rain will come and life will return to the earth. The people were so grateful to the Great Spirit for telling them what they must do. And they went back to their teepees to look for their most prized possession. One warrior went into his teepee and he found what he was looking for. And he said, I am so sure that the Great Spirit does not want my prized bow. One woman looked around her teepee and she found what she was looking for. And her words, I know the Great Spirit does not want my special blanket upon which I birthed my two babies. And so it went throughout the entire village. Everybody had an excuse to keep what he or she valued the most. Now, very few children were left in this village. They had all died pretty much from hunger. But there was one little girl, and her name was She Who Sits Alone. And in her teepee, she said to herself, O oh, Great Spirit, it is my warrior doll that you want. It's the only possession I have left from my mother, from my dad, from my parents. The doll, the doll had a belt made of bone. And it had beaded leggings. And on its head were beautiful blue flat feathers that matched the color of the sky. And she knew what she had to do. So later that night, folks, when everybody was asleep, she who sits alone crawled out of her teepee underneath her blanket. She reached down into the fire that was in front of the teepee, teepee, teepee and pulled out a lighted stick. And with that stick, and with that doll, she went to the top of the mountain. And then she placed the lighted stick on the ground. And she spoke, Great Spirit, here is my warrior doll. It is the only thing I have from my father and my mother, and it's my most cherished possession. Please accept it. So holding the doll in one hand, she gathered some twigs and small limbs and put it on top of the fire stick. And she fanned it up into a fire. And she reached out and she held the doll near it. And while she was sad, and while she was going to suffer from her loss, she thought about her parents and her grandparents and her friends who had died from hungry because of hunger, because of that drought. And then without any qualms, she dropped the doll onto the fire. And naturally, the doll burned. And when the flames died down and the ashes cooled, she scooped them up and she threw them up into the air. And the four winds took them and scattered them in every direction. And after all of this, she was absolutely exhausted. She didn't even have the energy to get back to her tent. She lay down there on the ground next to what was left of the fire, and she fell asleep without her doll, but with a big smile on her face. The next morning, the sun came up, and the brightness of the sun woke her up, and she sat up, and she looked out over a hill. And as far as she could see where her doll's ashes had been blown and fallen, the ground was covered, absolutely covered, with beautiful blue flowers like little blue bonnets. And they were as blue as those feathers that had been on her doll's head. And when the people awoke, and they came out of their teepees, they could hardly believe their eyes. They ran to the mountain as fast as they could to where she who sits alone was just gazing on this magnificent sight. And there was no doubt, no doubt in their minds 
the flowers were a sign from the Great Spirit that they were forgiven. And then they began to dance. And they began to sing. And they thanked the Great Spirit. And as they danced and sang and showed their thanksgiving, a very soft, gentle rain began to fall. And when it did, the land began to live again. And those people who had lost all hope were saved. Now, this classic Native American story of the origins of the blue bonnet flower gives us a powerful theme of willingness of one person to suffer so that good would win out as the Christian community today begins to enter into the season of Lent on this first Sunday Peter is writing to the growing number of followers of Jesus and he speaks of this same powerful idea if there was anybody in the whole Bible who was transformed by the resurrection of Jesus, it was Simon Peter. If you read the Gospels, Peter is often known and shown to have a lack of understanding. He rejects, he rejects the need for Jesus to suffer immediately after Jesus has declared him to be the rock upon which the church would be built. And then the saddest thing of all, is he denied Jesus three times on the morning of the crucifixion, right when Jesus needed him the most. But as the Acts of Apostles, that book in the Bible, the Acts, shows clearly Peter is a completely transformed person as a result of the resurrection. And then, from that point on, pretty much, he boldly proclaims his faith and is completely unfazed by threats from the Jewish religious leaders and the muckety-mucks who order him to stop preaching about this Jesus. It's this new, it's this transformed Simon Peter about whom we hear in our scripture this morning. He speaks to that fledgling Christian community by drawing a comparison between the suffering, between their suffering as the Christian community and the sufferings of Jesus. Just as Jesus triumphed over death through his resurrection, he tells them, so will they. Peter tells them that baptism is their pledge of this triumph for it gives them a share, it gives them a dog in the hut, if you will, in the Lord's resurrection. They have a part in it. The apostle makes an additional connection with the Old Testament figure that George read about, with Noah. Just as Noah and his family were saved by passage through the waters of the flood, so Christians, those Christians back then, us Christians sitting here right now, are saved by our passage through the waters of baptism. The suffering that the community, the Christian community endured during the apostolic period and beyond that was overcome by the faith of the people and by the fidelity of people. They took to heart the words that Peter spoke in today's reading. They believed that the suffering and death that Jesus endured as terrible and as tragic as it was, guess what? It led to a very positive result. And now they could be confident that they, like Jesus and Peter, could boldly live their new faith. They could live in word. They could live it in action. And they could be confident that in the end, it would be, bring triumph for themselves and the entire community of faith. Folks, Christians today and Christians between that time years ago and now 
owe a huge debt of gratitude to these great men and women of faith because it's on their 